Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello, welcome to today's presentation, Anatomy Preserving Spine Surgery, presented by Dr. Sandeep Kunwar, neurosurgeon with Washington Township Medical Foundation and medical director of the Taylor McAdam Bell Neuroscience Institute at Washington Hospital. Dr. Kunwar is board certified in neurosurgery and renowned for his work in minimally invasive neurosurgery. Dr. Kunwar specializes in minimally invasive brain and spine surgery. His innovative work in these fields and pioneering research in drug delivery to the brain have brought him national and international recognition. He has performed more than 2,500 minimally invasive operations and has developed a minimally invasive approach to skull-based tumors and improved access to the spine. Dr. Kunwar also works to improve the use of technology to perform standard procedures through less invasive approaches. He teaches other neurosurgeons these advanced technologies. He also presents at national and international medical conferences on a region basis. Please welcome Dr. Kunwar. Hi, welcome. <clears throat> so today I'm hoping to talk about uh, anatomy preserving spinal surgery and some of the benefits of minimally invasive spine surgery, really an evolving field uh, of how to do uh, surgery to treat pathology when surgery is needed without causing additional damage. And that's what we discuss about anatomy preserving uh, spinal surgery. So we're going to start by talking about spinal stenosis, which is narrowing of the spinal canal. It's most, one of the more common problems that happens as we get older. This is a cross-section of the spine itself, and the front here is the disc space, um, which is the gel padding between the bones, and the back is the lamina, which covers the back part of the canal, and then the spinous process, which are the bumps you feel on your back. Inside here is your spinal canal, which is the most critical thing we look at when we're looking at imaging structures. We can actually see the individual nerve roots floating in spinal fluid. Now, as we get older, these joints start to get bigger. You get a combination of bone spurs, degenerative disc disease, as well as ligament thickening that then causes this tunnel to get smaller and smaller. And instead of the nerves floating in fluid, oftentimes the nerves get squeezed together, and that's what we call lumbar stenosis. As I mentioned, it's one of the more common problems as, as we get older and really related to arthritis or wear and tear. As I tell some of my patients, it's like driving a car for 20 years. You can expect to have some wear and tear, how much it wears down really is quite variable and dependent on different factors. The symptoms that develop from lumbar stenosis are pretty classic. Uh, the symptoms include burning, cramping, pins and needles involving the thighs, the calves, occasionally the buttocks. It can have back pain. When you squeeze a nerve, you get back pain, goes into the buttocks, and then eventually will go down the legs. And typically these symptoms with claudication because of lumbar stenosis occur when you're walking for a certain distance or when you're standing for a period of time. So the longer you walk, the more symptoms you develop, and typically the symptoms improve when you sit down, when you bend or lean forward, when you lie down, or when you put your foot on a raised rest. And so patients with lumbar stenosis initially can walk four or five blocks, and it becomes two blocks, and eventually becomes a parking lot. Shopping carts become their friends because when you lean forward, that actually provides some relief on the nerve compression. And we can sort of understand the mechanics of this. This is a structural pathology of the spine. When we're sitting down or when we're leaning forward, we go into flexion. And when we go into flexion, that actually opens up some of the holes. Here's one of the holes called a foramen, and you can see the nerve root exiting. It opens it up a little bit, so it alleviates some of the pain uh, or the symptoms. When we stand, we go into extension or when we walk. And by extension, the, the tunnel starts to narrow down. Now, it's okay when you're young and you have a very large tunnel with lots of space. Losing one or two millimeters doesn't make any difference. But when you have lumbar stenosis, there's no space left anymore. When you then squeeze down the tunnel, that actually causes nerve compression and causes symptoms to develop that typically is relieved with sitting or leaning forward. And we can see this very well in an MRI scan. An MRI scan has great detail to look at all the anatomy we want internally. So this is a, a side view of the spine. Uh, the belly is out front here. The back is back here. This is the lumbar spine, and this is the tailbone down here. So we call this segment the S1 segment. And then we have L5, L4, and L3. And these are nice, healthy-looking 
disk spaces, the jello pads within it. So again, this is a normal, healthy looking MRI scan. Here's your spinal canal. That's the tunnel where the nerves go through. And we can see the individual nerve roots and all this light gray or white is actually spinal fluid. So I, I kind of call this the kind of the nerves are living in a 3,000 square foot house. It's definitely more space than you need. And remember, every time you stand or you walk, that tunnel shrinks one or two millimeters, but you can see there's plenty of space there. Here's another view looking from above. So it's a cross section of the abdomen. So this is the front of the spine. This is the back of the spine. These are the big back muscles. Um, and there's your spinal canal. And you can see every individual nerve root. And again, again, that 3,000 square foot house analogy, plenty of space for the nerves to live in. As, we, as I said, as the, the joints get bigger, the ligaments get thicker, sometimes you have what's called a spondylolisthesis, which is a slippage of the spine. It's a more uh, accelerated version of arth arthritic or degenerative disease. You get spinal stenosis. So you can see here, this disc here is wearing down a little bit compared to the disc below. This is again the side view. Here's your spinal canal. And again, you can see fluid within the spinal canal at the upper levels. But at this level, which we call L4-5, there's no space there whatsoever. In fact, all the nerve roots have to squeeze through that little tunnel. And then, of course, down below, it's quite open. And this is with a, someone lying down. So we know when they stand and when they walk, this space gets even tighter, thus squeezing the nerve roots. If you look at that top-down view, again, remember what a normal spine looks like, where you see a lot of space and the nerves floating in fluid. And slowly, over time, that tunnel gets smaller and smaller until eventually all the nerves are squeezed into a little window where there's no fluid left anymore. It's only at this time where then symptoms start to develop. And again, this is a structural problem. So what are the treatment options? Well, we always start with conservative measures. I mean, uh, things like epidural steroid injections and physical therapy can be helpful, especially if the symptoms are mild or episodic. Unfortunately, we know if the, someone has severe lumbar stenosis where there's no spinal fluid left in the, in the spinal canal and the nerves are being squeezed, all these measures will be temporary. Epidurals will help quiet the nerves down, but as soon as the medicine wears off, the symptoms will come back. So in those situations, we consider surgery. So if someone's limited in ambulation, if someone can't walk more than two or three blocks, stand for more than 10 to 15 minutes, and have failed the conservative measures, then we consider uh, moving forward with surgery. There's a couple of operations we do, the simplest of which and the most common is called the decompression, which is just alleviating the pressure off of the nerves. So the primary si treatment is the squeezing of the nerves that we're trying to address, not really the degenerative disc disease or the arthritis. One thing to always remember is we always see arthritis in the MRI scans and x-rays. It's pretty common, again, as we get older. But not all arthritis cause symptoms, and therefore fixing the what we see isn't always the goal. The goal is fixing what's causing the symptoms. And so the standard approaches for a decompression, alleviating the pressure on the nerve roots, traditionally have been laminectomy and foraminotomy, or now uh, sort of an evolving field is more intralaminar decompression, or what we call laminotomy. But the most important thing is that the abnormality we see on the MRI scan has to fit with what the symptoms are. And if they don't fit, of course, fixing what we see on the MRI scan is not going to make the patient any better. So let's talk about the surgical options of decompression. Again, these are patients with lumbar stenosis. Typically, they have some back pain, some buttock pain, but the majority of the pain is in the legs, and there's no evidence of instability. If someone's spine is moving abnormally, then just freeing up the nerve roots may not be enough. And again, this is the most common problem that develops, and the most common operation is called a laminectomy. It's still the most commonly uh, uh, performed operation. It's essentially making that you know, 3,000 square foot house and that became a 200 square foot house and make it into a 10,000 square foot house. We remove a lot of the structures around the spine to give the nerves a lot of space. It's a very effective operation. It relieves the pressure on the nerve roots. The, more, uh, the, the evolving technology now is called an interlaminar decompression. It's really just focusing on what the problem is, not disrupting some of the normal anatomy. Let's talk about this a little bit more. So the laminectomy. Again, this has been done for years now. Again, if we go back to our patient, she's got severe stenosis. She's unable to walk more than two or three blocks or stand more than five to 10 minutes. Again, you can see all the nerve roots squeezed into a small opening because these joints have gotten bigger, because of the disc protruding slightly, and because of the thickened ligaments. So a standard laminectomy essentially removes all this bone. This is the spinous process in the lamina. And again, here's the spinous process in the lamina. So essentially, by removing all that bone, we have to dissect free the muscles. We're making a much, much bigger canal than, uh, than even was there uh, at birth. But it's very effective in freeing up the nerves, but there may be some other side effects from that. So these are kind of some images of what a, a two-level laminectomy is. Sometimes people have c compression at two levels or three levels, most commonly at one level. But we make an incision. We dissect the muscles off the spine. You can see the anatomy very clearly. Each one of these is here's the L4 space, the L5 space, the L3 space. We have clear access to all the structures we need. We remove some of the bone off the spinal nerves. We can see the nerves being nice and free. This is kind of what it looks like in an open procedure. And then we stitch everything back together again. 
There's some issues with laminectomies or open surgery. One, it requires removal of the lamina and the ligaments that uh, uh, separate or are attached to the bone above and below. Those are structural ligaments. I think of the spine as a stool with four legs. And when you do a laminectomy and remove those ligaments, now you have a stool with three legs. It's stable, but not as stable. And that can lead to progressive instability over time because we know the disc, which is another leg of that stool, wears down. This can lead to post-laminectomy syndrome and oftentimes the reason why pe patients may need a spinal fusion in the future to help stabilize that stool again. The other issue is the atrophy of the tissues. And you can see here's a healthy CT scan. A CT scan focuses on bone. We can also see soft tissue. These are the back muscles, very large muscles uh, in the back. And when someone's had a laminectomy that's open, you can see the incision here. The muscles have been stripped off of the bone. You can see what happens to the muscles. It all turns into scar tissue and shrinks down because that's the attachment of the muscles to the bone has been disrupted. So the, we're causing some muscle irritation and scarring. We're causing some instability of the spine. The question is that really necessary, although it's effective. So going back to the same patient, we can see that they got the stenosis here. Why remove all this bone here? There's no, uh, the, the, the spinal canal is fine here. Really, it's just a focal problem. So now with an intralaminar decompression, we can work between the lamina, so that's why it's called intralaminar, without cutting any muscles, leave the spinous process, these are ligaments attaching the two spinous processes together, and really shave back the bone spurs to open up the tunnel. A lot of my patients call this rotor rootering. We're kind of opening up the spinal canal back to the same size it was before. So we're going from that 3,000 square foot house to a 200 square foot house back to about a 2,000 square foot house, and the nerves have plenty of space again without disrupting the normal anatomy. And this is all done through what's called tubular retractors is the most common way of doing it. These are serially dilated, dil so you can see the small dilator comes in, so a very small two millimeter dilator, and then a four millimeter, and a six, and a seven, and it goes all the way in. So what we're doing is we're splitting the muscle fibers. We don't have to cut any of the muscles. So in a cross section, you can see the tube docks onto the lamina and spinous process, and then through that window, using a microscope, we can shave back the bone spurs, but leaving all the normal structure, including the muscle attachments and the ligaments in place. This is kind of what we do the operation through. So remember the other operation where you can see the anatomy very well, here we barely see any anatomy. In fact, we have to be very accurate as to where we're located. But you can see this could be done through a small window without opening up or cutting any of the tissues. This is kind of a view down the microscope. So after the decompression is done, all the thickened ligaments and the bone spurs are removed, this is the dural sac. The dura is a lining around the spine and the brain. That's what contains all the spinal fluid. And it's like a water balloon. It initially was being squeezed in like an hourglass, and once we decompress it, that balloon reopens. Now we know the nerves are floating in fluid again. And th here's the tube that we're working through, and that tube is less than an inch in size. And then as we remove the tube, you can see all the muscle fibers coming back together again, and that's the opening that we did the whole operation through. Not only can we do decompressions through this, these approaches, we can now do even more complicated operations, including tumor resections and even spinal fusions through a small window. So that same patient had a bilateral L4-5 uh, interlaminar decompression. From one side, we can decompress both sides. It's sometimes it's called over-the-top decompression. The patient had complete resolution of her claudication, was able to ambulate right away. Um, blood loss is minimal. There's really no uh, uh, muscle cutting, so we lose about less than a tablespoon of blood. And the hospital stay now is a come-and-go operation. And we do the operation in the morning. Patients go home in the afternoon. And interestingly, because of the anatomy of the spine, through one incision, we oftentimes can do two different levels separately. So what are the advantages of minimally invasive surgery? Again, it's a smaller incision, which means less scar tissue formation, less blood loss, even with complex operations we do, including multi-level fusions for scoliosis, for example, the likelihood of blood transfusion is minimized. Uh, normal less uh, t tissue trauma, meaning long term, there's gonna be less scarring, less atrophy of the muscles, shorter hospital stays, faster recovery, and, it, and overall, there's lower complication rates. The disadvantages, it's oftentimes a longer operation. For standard laminectomy, it may take 20 to 30 minutes. To do it through a small tube, it sometimes can take 45 minutes to an hour. And again, again it's much easier to get two hands in there, big, big instruments in there. But again, do we really need to do that because we're causing more uh, damage to the surrounding tissues? There's a definite learning curve. Um, as you can see, you don't, we don't have the exposure of the entire anatomy. For example, you know, looking at one building, can you tell what's where you are in the city versus looking at three or four blocks, and then you know exactly what part of the city you're in. But we have technology to make that better. We use x-rays, which is why we have sometimes increased use of fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is x-ray images because to make sure we're, where we're at. And for more complicated operations, we've got what's called neuronavigation, which is a computer guidance. It's kind of like a built-in GPS system where we can track the entire spine and know exactly where we are in three dimensions without actually having to see the spine itself. 
This is especially advantageous in elderly patients, meaning because of the less blood loss, less trauma, there's less lower uh, anesthetic risks. Older patients, when there's a lot of blood loss and need for transfusions, the risks of complications go up significantly. The shorter hospital stay also means a decreased risk of blood clots, which are called DVTs, and also a decreased risk of pneumonia, which is an infection of the lungs. There's also less skin and muscle trauma, and therefore, again, the lower risk of infection. And it really opens up the indications for treatment of severe spine disease in the elderly population. You know, 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago when I was in training, we would never even talk about doing surgery in an 85 or 90 year old. It was just kind of off the, off the field. But nowadays it's kind of routine. And because the complication rates are much lower, because patients are remaining active, and of course the most important thing is for patients to walk, and lumbar stenosis stops them from walking, we can do these operations to get them walking again with very low risk. We even now do these operations, including more complicated spinal fusion operations in even 90 years old, if it makes sense. And again, it's the heart and the lungs that are now more important, not the actual age. There's also one other advantage is we can sometimes avoid destabilizing that stool even further. This is another patient, very similar pathology. You can see that slippage of the spine. That slippage of the spine, as I said, is a more advanced form of arthritis, is a side view. And again, a patient who's got severe stenosis where the nerve roots are being compressed at that level, unable to walk or stand because of the, of the nerve root compression of the lumbar stenosis. Typically in this operation, everyone told her she needed a fusion. Because in order to open this up and you did a laminectomy, that slippage already means one of those legs of the stool is, is, is weak. So now you're on three legs, you do a laminectomy, now you're on two legs. Well, stool can't stand up on two legs, therefore we do a spinal fusion. We have to stabilize that spine to prevent it from moving. But a spinal fusion, although we can, it's better now, we can also do it through small incisions. It's a much bigger operation, longer recovery time, and has other sequelae. And we try to avoid it when we can, well now with the ability to do an intralaminar decompression, you can see we can come in here, the spinous process was not removed, the interspinous ligaments are still intact, the muscles are still attached, and we can free up the spinal, uh, the, the spinal stenosis without having to do a, a, a fusion. So now these operations can actually maybe allow you to have a smaller operation, less of an operation, but still accomplishing what needs to be done, which is freeing up the nerve roots. So sort of in summary, this is kind of uh, what we've been talking about is neurogenic claudication, which is a structural abnormality that can lead to symptoms of burning, cramping, pins and needles. Again, always symptoms that get worse with walking uh, or standing for a period of time. Symptoms that improve with sitting or bending or leaning forward. Again, the grocery cart maneuver, for example. There may be some back pain, but a majority of the symptoms may be buttock and leg pain. And again, what we're talking about anatomy preserving surgery is again, really conventional surgery. We're not doing less of an operation. We're still doing the standard operations, but doing it through smaller incisions, minimizing removal of normal tissue. In fact, with these operations, everything you were born with, you get to keep. We're just shaving back the bone spurs and the thickened ligaments to make the tunnel bigger. So again, there's less soft tissue and muscle damage. There's definitely reduced postoperative morbidity, which means complications, uh, decreased postoperative stay. Majority of these operations are come and go. And even for the more complicated fusion operations now, patients go home within one or two days. It's very safe and reproducible once experience is, a, is acquired. And again, the biggest impact is in the elderly population and getting them to be remain active and, and, and walking again. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, if there's any questions, I can be contacted by the, uh, these methods and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Kunwar. We do have some questions. The first question we have is, is spinal surgery a high-risk surgery? Yeah, whenever we talk, that's a good question. Whenever we talk about the brain or the spine, <coughs> we always consider that high risk because the sequelae of any complications can be quite significant. Um, the good news is, is we've made it very safe now with the technology that we have. For example, blood loss is minimized, uh, uh, pneumonia and, and blood clots are, are, are decreased. The biggest concern is always nerve damage. And oftentimes with majority of the operations we do, we do what's called neuromonitoring. So during the operation, we actually have electrodes, little needles in the arms and the legs. We can monitor the electrical signals. Nerves work on electrical uh, uh, signals and there we can pick those up. But so we know if there's too much pressure or irritation in the nerve. So the likelihood of nerve damage now has significantly increased and hence why now it's become an uh, outpatient operation in most cases. Okay, and the next question we have is, how do I prepare my body for spine surgery? That's a good question. You know, the, how patients do after the surgery is very dependent on how they do beforehand. For example, if someone comes in walking and f relatively independent, we know they'll be able to go home and be independent at home. So in some ways, we don't want to wait too late. When someone comes in in a wheelchair, hasn't been walking for three or four months, of course, there's going to be a lot of rehab, rehabilitation to be able to build up the muscles and the strength and the energy afterwards. Many of these operations are elective, so we sometimes have the option to do physical therapy 
not to try to fix the problem, just to make patients more functional so their recovery will be a lot better. Good. The next question we have is, how long is a typical hospital stay after spine surgery, and how long overall does it take to recover? Yeah, so it's another good question. So, you know, the surgery really depends on what we're operating on. And for these decompression operations treating lumbar stenosis, that's typically about a 45 minute to an hour operation. And that's from the surgery from going to sleep to waking up. Um, there's a lot of other steps involved. Um, for multiple levels, we'll actually do two and sometimes even three levels at the same sitting depending on what the anatomy shows. Then it could take anywhere from one to three hours of time. And we also do some spinal fusions through these smaller openings, and again, they do take longer. So a typical one-level spinal fusion through these one-inch incisions or smaller is typically about a two to three-hour operation. Multi-level scoliosis operations can take up to four to six hours, but the advantage is the patient's recovery is much quicker. So for the decompressions, they typically go home in one day. There is a recovery at home. We typically talk about uh, uh, walking only for the first four to six weeks and avoiding the three things that can cause aggravation of arthritis, which is, of the spine that is, which is bending, lifting, and twisting. So we avoid those for the first six weeks, and then after six weeks we get back into exercising, uh, treadmill, stationary bicycle, and by three months patients can go back to normal sports again, and including golfing, tennis, pickleball at that stage. Great, and our last question, what can I do to keep my back and spine healthy? That's key, prevention is always important. <laughs> if you can avoid it from happening, that's always the goal. And like driving a car, <laughs> why do some cars last two years and some cars last 20 years? There's a lot of variability involved. One is genetics, we can't control that. Some people uh, are born with uh, pr more progressive wear down of the joints and that's what mom and dad gave you unfortunately. Some joints last for a very long time. The second is wear and tear and this is where we can have an influence in. As I mentioned, the three things that actually aggravate the degenerative process, the wear down of the joints is bending, lifting and twisting. Bending, for example, we should always be bending using our hips and knees, or big joints are designed for that, if you think about monkeys and dogs. When, what that means is when you bend, the butt should be sticking out with a slight flexion in the, a slight bend in the knees. If your butt is sticking in, you're bending with your back. And it's easier because you're using your spine to carry your weight, rather than using your buttock muscles, your gluteus muscles, which are very large muscles, and can support your weight. So again, bending is key. Lifting, you know, again, it's like driving a car. If you drive 20 miles, it's gonna last a long time. You drive 200 miles, a day, it's gonna wear down faster. Lifting 15 to 20 pounds is probably okay. If you've got good core strength, lifting more is, is, proper, is okay as long as you lift it properly. But lifting repetitively 30 to 50 pounds with poor form, not bending, your, you know, bending with your back and not with your, with your hips, that's gonna aggravate the arthritic process. Okay, well thank you so much Dr. Kunwar for this insightful presentation. This does conclude our program. And thank you viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's presentation will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube.